talk to me about how animal meats end up, because you don't eat hardly any. Um, how, how does lectin find its way into animal meat? We raise animals with antibiotics. And this was discovered by, by accident years ago when they were thinking that antibiotics might be needed for crowded conditions of uh, you know, stockyard animals. But the researcher found out that by giving antibiotics to these animals, they grew faster and got fatter much quicker than the animals who didn't get the antibiotics. Mm -hmm. So it was approved uh, by the Department of Agriculture and the FDA to give antibiotics to animals for the purpose of growth. Those, what we didn't know is that those residual antibiotics are incorporated into the meat, mm -hmm. uh, the beef, the chicken, the pork, you name it. And so we actually, every time we ingest factory-raised meats, or even farm-raised fish ingest micro doses of antibiotics. Micro doses of antibiotics are incredibly effective at killing off your microbiome. Mm -hmm. So, in the last 40 years, we've had this, you know, incredible, you know, the, the worst storm that could possibly happen for our microbiome and for our leaky gut. So then our lectins there are lectin-like substances in the meat, but is there actually lectin itself? Great question. There was just a paper published from Ohio State a few weeks ago that shows that lectins in soybeans can be found in the meat of animals that you feed them to. Mm -hmm. Now, I used to think that this was kind of fanciful in the alternative medicine world. You know, you are what you eat, but you are what the thing you're eating ate. And as I started seeing more and more autoimmune patients, uh, we had case reports of, uh, particularly there's a woman psychologist in LA that I talk about in the book who had horrible lupus, was on two drugs, and we got her off of all her drugs by following this program, and her, her lupus cleared, uh, she had rashes, and um, she, she came back to see me, and she, said, you know, everything's great, but I've got this eczema, this little rash on my upper eyelids. And so we're going through the list. I said, well, something's getting into you. Mm. And we get to pasture-raised chicken. And I said, now you're, you're eating pasture-raised chicken. She said, oh yeah, I eat organic free-range chicken all the time. It's my go-to food. I said, free-range chicken? And she said, yeah, yeah, you know, organic free-range. I said, well, the federal government in 2007 passed a law that says you can keep 100,000 chickens in a warehouse, feed them organic corn and soybeans, and not let them out of the warehouse except open a door for five minutes every 24 hours and the chicken has the potential to go outside. And that is the current government definition of organic free range chicken. Wow. So she was eating the lectins of soybeans and corn mm in the chicken that she was eating. I trained in London, England uh, for children's heart surgery and my kids were four and six years old and they missed Kentucky Fried Chicken terribly. And a Kentucky Fried Chicken opened in London. Now in those days, there was so much fish available in England that the chickens were fed ground up fish meal. Whoa. And the, the chicken breasts were actually translucent, like fish. And uh, so, you know, we go to Kentucky Fried Chicken, they both grab a drumstick and they bite into the drumstick and my four-year-old goes, oh, oh, you tricked us. This is fish. Oh, this isn't chicken. Whoa. And I'm going, oh, no, 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 no. Look, you know, drumstick, you know, Colonel right. Sanders, that's chicken. No, oh, it's fish. Well, she was right. It wasn't oh. a chicken. It was a chicken with feathers that was actually a fish. So we have to realize that our chickens are no longer chickens. They're an ear of corn with feathers. Americans are 70% carbon atoms from corn, Whoa. a substance that we were never exposed to until 500 years ago. Europeans are 5% corn. In fact, France in, in 1900 banned corn as unfit for human consumption. Wow. So yeah. what I want people to do is, is eat 
and party like it's 9,999 years ago before we started all this mess. Mm. And when we do that with people and teach them how to do it, it's amazing what happens to them. Well, let's talk about that because if I had um, only heard some headlines about you, I would have thought, oh, red meat, I'll get after it because I eat a ton of red meat and think I'm doing healthy things. So you don't eat a lot of meat, why not? So we found that there was a, a molecule, a sugar molecule on the wall of pig blood vessels that's totally different from the sugar molecule that's in ours. But it differs by only one actually atom. And it's, new, it's called NU5GC uh, in pigs, cows, and lambs. And we carry what's called NU5AC. And I have nothing against red meat. But if you look statistically, the red meat eaters do have significantly more coronary artery disease and significantly more cancer. Now, why cancer? Well, it turns out that cancer tumors in humans use NU5GC to shield themselves from detection by the immune system. Mm. The problem is we don't manufacture NU5GC, nor can a cancer cell, which means they acquired it from external sources, namely beef, lamb, and pork. Now, fish doesn't carry it. They have the same molecule that we do, and chicken have the same molecule that we do. So I urge people, uh, if they're going to eat animal protein, and I, I do, uh, to use wild shellfish or wild fish as their main source of animal protein. Do I eat meat? Yeah, I mean, do I eat beef? I do. Uh, but I get grass-fed and grass-finished beef, and I use it as, as a treat, not as a mainstay of my diet. Mm. And then what's your take on eggs? The yolk of the egg may be the most beneficial food that has ever been invented. And as long as the chickens are fed what they're designed to eat. When I actually ask people to mainly throw the whites away. Uh, so we'll do a, a four egg omelet, but four of them are yolks and just use one white. And what is it in the whites or about the whites that make them problematic? It's, okay, it's animal protein. And let's look at another reason not to eat animal protein, sadly. So animal protein, there, we, there's a sensor in all of our cells called mTOR. And it senses energy availability. And it senses sugar availability, but it senses certain amino acid availability. So if you avoid or lessen your amount of animal protein, your mTOR will fall. Now, we have no way of measuring clinically mTOR, but we can use a surrogate for that which is insulin-like growth factor, IGF-1. And in my super old people, and I study a lot of super olds, 95 and above, wow. um, they all have extremely low insulin-like growth factors. And why, why is that a number you want to get down? Because super old people always run low insulin-like growth factors. They always do. And uh, in my upcoming book, The Longevity Paradox, if you look at societies of the blue zones, the longest living people on earth, the common factor that they all have in their diet, they have very diverse diets. Uh, there's no universal diet that these people follow. Mm. And I was a professor at one of the blue zones, Loma Linda, for most of my life. The thing that separates or, or unites all of those various diets is they eat very little animal protein. And one of the things we notice about super old people is they run low body temperatures. They're running 96 degrees, whereas you and I are running 98.6. Mm. And they become incredibly efficient creatures. My mentor, uh, Dr. Morrow, always said that you only have so many heartbeats. And when you use those up, uh, that's the end. And he's actually right in a lot of ways, uh, but the corollary to that is, let's suppose your design is that you only get so many calories in your lifetime. 
and you can use them quickly or you can spread them out. And that's why, that's why fasting uh, is so useful and intermittent fasting is so useful because it's actually an easy way just to reduce your calorie intake. And it's, you know, once you learn how to do it, it's, it's an easy way to make the system work. How do you pull it off? So I'm a huge proponent of intermittent fasting and fasting in general. Um, how do you do it? How do you make it an easy process? So I started uh, 11 years ago uh, at January 1st to June 1st. Uh, during the week, I would eat all my calories in a two-hour window from 6 to 8 o'clock at night. So that 22 out of the 24 hours every day, five days a week, I was fasting 22 hours. Now, why six to eight o'clock at night? Because that's when my wife and I were at home. And um, now, this is, as you know, uh, for a professional driver on a closed course. Right. What most people who try to do this don't realize, uh, about 80% of us in America are insulin resistant. We have much too much insulin production. Mm -hmm. And I won't bore you or the listeners, but most people can't do prolonged fasting for even more than a few hours because they can't access the fat that they've stored. Right. And they crash. And it's often called the Adkins flu or the low carb flu, where they have to be able to transition over to using ketones as a fuel. Mm. Now you can get there fairly quickly and we have tips in the book on how to do that. You actually have to use exogenous ketones for a while, things like MCT oil, things like coconut oil, even red palm oil. There's a little bit of exogenous ketones in butter. It's called butyric acid. Yeah, it's um, intermittent fasting is really, really powerful for alleviating brain fog for changing a relationship to hunger is how I always think of it. It's just fundamentally different. And then getting your machinery used to actually accessing your body fat and all that. We're designed to use up fat. We just have to, you know, use the tricks to get to that fat. For most people who are overweight or obese, what's so frustrating for them is they try things like intermittent fasting and they're pretty miserable, they get headaches, and they're, they're very hungry, their brain is going, hey, you know, what, what's the deal, you've cut me off. Mm. It's water, water everywhere, and not a drop to, to drink. And we see so many overweight and obese people, and I was 70 pounds overweight, I was obese, running 30 miles a week and going to the gym one hour a day, wow. and going, Why, how come I'm such a fat guy? I couldn't get to my fat stores because I had an elevated insulin level. Mm. When I first you know, got my insulin level, I was like, wow, um, what's that? Now I have a very low insulin level. Mm. No, that stuff is fascinating in terms of the complexities of really breaking through and figuring out for you, what do you have to do to lose fat, keep it off, and yeah, it's a, a very complex thing. And to that end, not necessarily, my question's not really about fat loss, but um, given what we've been talking about, lectins and autoimmune and all of those joints, aches, pains, all of the things that come along with it, uh, psoriasis, all of that, what should people be eating? So we, we've got a rough sense of what we should be avoiding, but what should we be actively pursuing? Okay, so uh, the only purpose of food is to get olive oil into your mouth. Um, <laughs> There are three long-lived societies in the blue zones that use a liter of olive oil per week. That's, That's about 12 to 14 tablespoons a day. Can I use it to saute? You can use it to saute. Believe it or not, there's a wonderful paper from the NIH showing that olive oil does not break down into harm harmful compounds. That's amazing. But bring olive oil to the table. So if you're gonna have a steak, please pour it on your meat, mm -hmm. as they do in Italy. They always bring a bottle of olive oil so you can have steak Florentina and just drench it with olive oil. The steak is there to get olive oil into your mouth. Mm. Broccoli is there to get olive oil into your mouth. Um, a salad is there to get olive oil into your mouth. So there are wonderful cruciferous vegetables. You can have all the bok choy, broccoli, cauliflower, have cauliflower pizzas. There's a great recipe in my cookbook for cauliflower pizza. Uh, Can I have Japanese sweet potatoes? Yes, please. Oh, they're so good. 
Yeah, but the purpose of the sweet potato is to get olive oil into your mouth. Yes, which works for me just fine if I can saute or use an air fryer. Yeah. You Have can, you done yes, the indeed. air fryers? Oh my God, they're like french fries. They sure are. So, yeah, so those out. are great for you. If you found this video helpful, I think you're gonna love this one. Why? Because mushrooms have incredible properties that you should know about to improve your health, your brain health, and your longevity. First of all, mushroom 